We are, uh, we're just enjoying the morning and our timing issues. <laughs> oh. Some days, they're just some days, aren't they? <laughs> Take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. You know, the, the last um, several weeks we've been in First Peter, or I mean Second Peter and looking at things that are coming, things that are happening and, and, and all that. And we, and we mentioned more in passing, but we mentioned that you know God's in control and we don't have to worry. But I, I want us to come back and backtrack a little bit to that very thought. And this morning while we are in Luke chapter 12, excuse me. Um, we're going to begin in verse 13 in just a moment. So kind of get the background of what's going on. You've got to back up to chapter 11 and, and just kind of see some of the pieces parts that are going on. Jesus had healed a man that was possessed with a devil that made him unable to speak. The Bible calls that a, a, a dumb spirit and he not, couldn't speak. And when he cast out the demon, then the man could speak. And he was, there was a lot of murmuring about that, and there were some that said, well, he's, he's casting out demons by Beelzebub, and, and so he deals with that, he talks about that, and Christ corrects our thinking uh, on that and teaches them then the sign of Christ to this generation is going to be the same as Jonah. Jonah was three days in the, in the belly of the whale, and then, and then Christ will be three days in the grave, and that's the sign of Messiah. Uh, one of the signs that to, to let him know. Then he goes on and teaches them about the parable of the candle and, and talking about primarily that being enlightened by Christ, having, having the Messiah, having the light on the inside of the body, not talking about a candle to light a room, but the candle that comes from inside, the light that comes from inside. When one knows Christ, when one puts their trust in the Messiah, we would call putting our trust in Christ. Remember, the word Christ is the same word in the Greek as the word Messiah is in the Hebrew. It means the anointed one. So all the prophecies of the Messiah are the prophecies of the anointed one of God who would come and pay the price for sin. And so he's trying to tell them this is, this is the sign here. And so when he, as he's speaking with them, he's talking about if the light be single, if the light be dedicated to God, there's a, there's a light that comes from inside. All saved people have a representation of God. There is a light about them, and we should allow that light to, to show. That should come from inside. We should allow God to control us. This is Paul's whole point about dying to Christ, because if Christ can't kill him, the, 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 the flesh him, then Christ can't live in him. And so he's kind of laying that down. And so about this point, <clears throat> one of the Pharisees asked him to come to his house and have supper with him. And so he goes to the Pharisee's house and sitting in his house, he begins to tell him about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. You know, we, we kind of get this idea somehow that as Christians, we're supposed to be totally passive and, and always sweet, thinking that's meekness. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is not a lack of boldness. Meekness is control of the Spirit of God to speak whatever needs to be spoken. And we should always speak the truth in love. But sometimes we need to say some things. They're not going to be well received. The people aren't going to like to hear it, but it's the truth and they need to hear the truth. People need to hear that this world is sinful, that we are all born in sin and that we need Christ and there's no other hope to heaven. People need to hear that. And, and that's not always a pleasant thing for people to hear. To be confronted with our sin is not joyful, and, but it needs to be spoken. If there's never the, the truth of sin, then there's no relief of the forgiveness of sins by Christ. And so he's sitting in their home, in, in this Pharisee's home, and he's talking about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. And, and then one of the scribes, or one of the lawyers, most likely a scribe, speaks up, and the lawyer says, well, in, in saying that, you, you include us also. And he goes on to tell them, tell the scribes, the lawyers, the hypocrisy of their life. By this point, there's a crowd that's gathered around the house now. So this Pharisee got a little more than he bargained for. He asked Christ to come and sit with him. I guess he expected Christ to just have a, 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 a theological banter or something passive. And Christ always deals with what needs to be dealt with. You know, the, the secret about love, and that we miss so often because we, we try to turn love into an emotion and not a verb. 
Love is action, and love is the conscious decision, the willful choice to place the needs or desires of someone else above our own. What did the Pharisees here and the, and these lawyers need to hear? They needed to hear that their life was a hypocrisy according to the Bible, according to Scripture. They needed to be brought into confrontation with reality. Well, that didn't go real well, as you can imagine. And so they began to argue with him, and they're trying to, trying to get him to say something that they could, they could catch him on. And of course, that doesn't happen. And this crowd is gathered around, and the Bible says it is an innumerable crowd. It's so much that they're stepping on each other. And this is where we're going to pick up the story. And, and I've titled this, Don't Worry, God Knows What We Need. And so I, I want you to look with me now in verse 13, Luke 12, verse 13. Said, and one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he defied the inheritance with me. And he said to him, man, we would say, sir, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto him, this is Jesus saying unto him, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, and he thought within himself, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much good laid up, and for many years take thy knees, eat, drink, be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul is required of thee. Then who shall these things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. Now, is this teaching it's wrong to have wealth? No. It's saying the problem is putting all your focus into wealth, building wealth, that is your, that is your security, that is your safety, that is everything to you, and not rich in God. First thing we need to deal with is our salvation. This is what he's telling him. Listen, tonight your soul's required of you. In other words, he's dying tonight, and he's never taken account, he's never done business with God regarding his soul. And he's saying, you got all this stuff, that's great. You're going to take your ease, that's great. But tonight, I'm going to require your soul. And all this stuff you've amassed, all this stuff you've accumulated, who does that now belong to? It's not you. We're not taking it with us. None of this stuff goes with us. No material possessions go with us when we go to heaven. The only thing that makes it to heaven with us are the things of God that we've done for him. Witnessing, taking care of the needy, tending to our brothers and sisters, looking out for people. Those are the things that last eternally because those are the things God told us would last eternally. So he, he's, telling us, so he's prepping them up. He says, listen, you need to understand possessions are not the answer. Possessions don't deal with your soul. Possessions don't get you to heaven. So let's, let's put possessions away and remember this, that God provides. And so Jesus now sits down and, and, or, or continues speaking and he tells them and, and, he, and he said unto his disciples, now remember, he turns to his disciples and he's speaking, but there's a multitude gathered around listening to every word that is being spoken. He turns to his, he said to his disciples, verse 22, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for the body which ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. He says, so I'm going to teach you some principles here. I'm going to show you how God loves you and how God provides for you. But the first thing you need to understand is that the life, and this is also the word for soul, the soul is more than food. And the body, this physical shell that we are in, is more than raiment. It's the, the things of our body is more than just about what clothes we put on. He's dealing with people that are concerned about having enough clothing. We stand in front of a closet and try to figure out, what did I wear last week so I don't look like an idiot on the tape coming up to preach wearing exactly the same thing every week because I have combos I like. It was so much easier in the military. If it was winter, it was a black uniform. If it was summer, it was a white uniform. I didn't have to pick. Let's go, oh, it's July whites. <laughs> it was so simple. Now I have tan and blue and black and different shirts to match and I got to make sure they match or my wife is going to be embarrassed that I walked out the door. 
And I find it interesting that when we got married, the thing she loved about me was my taste in clothing. Then after we got married, I realized that was a farce. I don't really have taste. You can't wear that. It matched when we dated. It doesn't match now. Okay. Just show me. I need like the little girt animals. You know, see? Or just go back to plaid shirt and overalls. Can we just do that and be done with it? Just, you know, I'll have my work in overalls and my son to go to meet in overalls and life will be good. You see, these folks, they were worried about having clothes. This was a big deal to them. It, it, they have season changes. It, they need clothes for the different seasons and, and they're concerned about having goods. This is normal. I mean, don't we do the same thing? I mean, really and truly, how many of us worry about having clothing? I mean, honestly, I have, I have hunting boots that are, that are actually rocky military boots, and they're great hunting boots, and, and then I have a thermal boot, which <laughs> if anybody's got some of my size, you know, if you want to pass those on, mine, mine's broke now. You go walking through the water, it comes right up in the boot because the whole sole, of, you know, I, they're only 30 years old. I don't understand that. But, but I, have, I, have, I have brown sort of casual dress and, and black casual dress, and I have a black dress shoe. I have Navy uniforms. I shouldn't have said that on there, should I? I'm, I'm authorized to wear Navy uniforms because I was honorably discharged. I can still wear them for special functions. And, and when my son and I get together, we take, every time he gains rank, we take pictures of us you know, because we're, we're now both the same rank. So I'm going to my police rank now because I was a lieutenant in the police department, so I, I outrank you again. We, and, and that's just, you know, that's, that's just shoes. I mean, I have, I have winter clothes and summer clothes and work clothes and painting clothes. And, you know, really and truly, I, I, don't, I don't have a need about clothes. I, I don't really have to worry about clothes. And I think most of us are the same way. Some of us still need to worry about shoes. We, we have one of our daughters, and I won't, I won't say her name, her initials are Elizabeth Renee. And she thinks her idol is Imelda Marcos. She's, you know, 610 pairs of shoes. I mean, she's all over it. You know, these people are actually worried about having enough clothing. But they also worried about possessions. That was a big deal. The more you had, the more wealthy you were. How many of you have seen um, uh, uh, Fiddler on the Roof? Remember the song that he sings, If I Were a Rich Man? You know, and he says, I see my Golda living like a proper uh, rich man's wife with a proper double chin. Uh, he talks about he built a great big house in the middle of town with one long staircase going up and another even longer going down and a third one going nowhere just for show. You know, that, that's a cultural thing. It really is. There's some cultural stuff in that, and, and that's really an exaggeration of some reality. And these people have the same thing. So, well, we got to, you know, the more stuff you have, they, they kind of grew up in the mentality that to show that you're blessed, you got to have a bunch of stuff. And, and it follows along the mentality we have, you know, the guy with the most toys at the end wins. And that's not really how it works. And God says, you don't need to worry about this stuff. God knows what you need. Life is more than what clothes you are. Your body is more than just the clothes you put on it. It's not about having proper clothing. Life is more than food. So he, so he says this. He says, listen, God provides. In 22, he, he, I mean, in, uh, in verse 24, he says, I'll take care of the food. He says, consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are you better than the fowls? And which of you, taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? If then ye be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? He says, consider the raven. Let's consider the raven. Do you have the raven? I'm sorry, the raven. Oh, so I don't have a raven. So just picture a raven, blackbird, you know, once upon a midnight dream, while I pondered we can... I'm sorry, that's not the consideration he meant. He said, consider the raven. The raven doesn't sow. He doesn't go out and plow a field. He doesn't plant seeds. He doesn't reap. He doesn't have a storehouse. He doesn't have a barn. He doesn't go around and collect food to pack it away for a, for a rainy day or a cold day. He doesn't do all that. He said, and God feeds him. He doesn't have to do any of that. He flies around. He makes noise. He is intricate. If you look at any bird, birds are just amazing to look at how God created them. He said he just is. 
God put him there, we can enjoy him. He serves a purpose in nature. He eats things that are negative to us. I wish I had about 300 scissor tails around my yard for flies and mosquitoes. He says, they, they don't have to worry about it. God takes care of them. He, he said, listen, who of you, who of us, can take thought and add a cubit to our stature? Now, I don't know about you, I'd like to be a cubit taller. I'm too short for too many things. It's embarrassing when I go work on my truck. I'm not tall enough to work on the inside of my truck, so I, I built me a 2 by 12 stand that I get up on so I can reach stuff because I'm too short. But who can do that? I'm going to be four inches taller. None of us can do that. We are what we are. And I like what he says here. If you are not able to do the thing which is least. By the way, this is one of the greatest arguments against abortion. Do you know that? The cells in our body, the DNA dictate who we are, how tall we are, the pigment of our skin and everything about us. And whether you're talking about the full systems all coordinated together. You're talking about the, the, the implanting in the cell that begins to divide. All the DNA is there. All of the systems already exist in that little, that little single cell that begins to multiply. That is a human. It's not fully developed, but it is a human. It doesn't become a human somewhere. It is a human. And the DNA has already dictated what the ears are going to look like and the color of the eyes and the blood type and everything else in that single cell that begins to divide that eventually becomes, it becomes a fully functional human being. And all you got to do is leave it alone, don't mess with it, and you will pop out a human in roughly nine months. He says, this is the least of stuff. This growing, God said, this is the least of stuff. This is nothing to me. Remember, God said that he spit on the ground and he formed clay and he breathed into the nostrils of a man that he formed and he became a living soul. All of the vessels, all of the neurons, all of the complexity of the human body, God went, he said, this is simple stuff. You can't even do the simple. You can't make yourself grow. So if you can't do that, if you can't even do the simplest thing on making yourself grow a little bit, why are you worried about everything else? I'll give you food. I know that you need... Do you not think that your father knows that you need food? Don't you understand that if your father will feed the ravens that serve no other purpose than to glorify God, don't you think he'll take care of you? The pinnacle of his creation, the one he's sending his son to die for, don't you think he'll feed you? Don't worry about it. You can't do the little things. Don't worry about the big things. And then he says, I'll take care of your clothing. In verse 27, consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you, this Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast in the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, ye of little faith? Which, which one do you have first, babe girl? Just hit it, whichever one it is. That is by Vicki DeLoach, a photographer. She calls this the lily of the field. Isn't that beautiful? Do you ever wonder where we get our appreciation for beauty? It comes from God. God who says he's the adorable one, the beautiful one. The next one is a field of lilies. This is a photograph, uh, photograph from Forrest Wander, W-A-N-D-E-R. It does not list the photographer by name, just his photography company. That's beautiful. And, and if you don't think God loves his creation and enjoys the beauty of his creation, take special note what he said right there. I say to you that Solomon, in all of his glory, was not arrayed like this. He didn't look this good. Go back to that other one, baby. Go on, one, more, one back. Look at the painting in that. You talk about a great palette of color. God knows what he's doing. 
the subtleties, the glory. And, and what is this going to do? It's going to spring up. We're going to ooh and all over it. Some places are going to cut these and sell them for as long as they, we will pay a fortune for a flower that is going to last on its good day a couple of weeks just so we can enjoy the beauty of it because maybe it won't grow where we live. And we just want to see it up close and be able to take in. And he said, if God closed the grass, Solomon wouldn't have rained like this. This is just grass. It's here, and then the sun comes up and it goes away. If God is willing to clothe grass in such beauty, don't you think he'll take care of you? He knows you need clothes. These don't do anything. They don't work. They don't spin. Anybody tell me what spin means? Not to whirl around. Thread. They don't, they don't take cotton or wool and put it on a machine that spins it and you, and you just keep pulling it till it gets to the size that you want and you just keep doing that and rolling it up a little bit and then you pull some more and, and wind it down and push it up a little bit more. Sometimes you ought to look up how to run a spindle. It's very, very intriguing. They don't do that. They don't make clothes. They don't, they don't make thread so they can put it in a loom. My, my great aunts used to have a loom. I used to love to watch one of my great aunts. I can't remember which one she is anymore. I just remember seeing her as a little boy. I wasn't allowed to go all the way upstairs. I had some interesting elderly maiden aunts. And, but one was really cool. She'd go, come on up here. And she would let me sit at the top of the stairs and watch her make material. And she'd pass that piece of wood with a string on it and and then and she would comb it down and then she would hit another another pedal on the bottom and it'd raise another piece and it opened up the thread a different way she passed it through and then she'd hit another one she passed it through and she just kept raising different ones and then she'd comb it down and pack and she made some of the most beautiful stuff I've ever seen in my life. You see they don't do that. They don't toil. They don't spin. And they're just here for a moment and then they're burned up. And God cares so much about creation that he dresses them up in absolute beauty, so much so that the greatest guy that, that anybody could think of in that day, the most beautiful, the most elegant, the richest, the most, the most whatever flamboyant was Solomon. He says, Solomon wasn't even close to this. He says, I I'll take care of your clothing needs. You don't have to worry about it. So then he tells us you need to get some priorities here. And the first thing we need to do in our priorities is to be focused and we need to be focused on God. Verse 29, he said, And seek ye not what, she, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful, of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. You realize all that we have to do? All we have to do to make sure we have clothing and food and, and a place to live, everything, all we really need to do is just focus on God. That's it. Focus on God. He'll take care of it. He'll make sure we have a job. He'll make sure that we have everything. Now, we can, we can be foolish and blow everything and, and wipe ourselves out, but God will provide. God will take care of it. All we have to do is just honor Him. He said, in fact, you just need to focus on Him more than anything else. Let Him do the worrying about what you need. You just worry about God. You just focus on God. Seek the kingdom, and these things will be added to you. All you need to do is just focus on Jesus. Get your eyes set on heaven and what is to come and how we need to lay up treasures there. In fact, he's going to give us more definition. He said, be focused on God, but also be focused on others. Verse 32, fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Oh, wow, the kingdom of God? He's given it to us. This is not our final destination. This is not our final home. This is not our ultimate wealth and, and everything. Listen, if you have millions in the bank or you have 300 in the bank, it matters not. God is still God. And there's a kingdom. There's a kingdom coming that we're going to see with physical eyes, not just the spiritual kingdom of God that we're living in and trying to bring people into. There's a physical kingdom that is beyond our imagination. So if you've got $40 billion in the bank, you've got the greatest of everything, it can't compare to what's coming. Cannot be. The, the Bible says that 
eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the mind of man what God is doing. And quite frankly, any imagination we would have would be offensive to what God's really doing because if you just look at a lily and the beauty in that and then figure what the Bible describes he's building, oh my goodness. I heard somebody say, what if you get to heaven and you can, and, and somebody sings and you can taste the notes or you can smell the notes. or Maybe they're in color. Oh, wow, did you smell that? Look at the color coming out of his voice. I don't know what heaven means. I don't know what's there, but the Bible says it's beyond my ability to comprehend. He says, fear not. God's given you the kingdom. Sell that you have and give alms. In other words, sell what you got. Don't, get rid of your excess. Don't, don't, don't hoard. This is not saying don't have reserves to take care of yourself. The Bible tells us to lay up treasure for our children's children. We are to be wise with our money. We are to have an account. We are to have a, a, a early safety net. I mean, I don't know how you want to say that. It doesn't sound like we're trying to dishonor God. There's nothing wrong with building wealth. There's nothing wrong with having things. But he said, don't let that be your focus. Don't be afraid to give. God gives you so you can give to others. Yes, lay up for yourselves. Lay up things that you need. You know, You'll, you'll have property and you have cattle. Obviously, you need to lay up stuff because at some point, you're going to have to buy hay or a really expensive baler. So, I mean, please understand, this is not God saying, you got to take a vow of poverty. You can't own anything. That's not what he's saying. He said, let your focus be on God. Don't be afraid to give what God gives you. He wants to use us as a channel of his blessings. And let me say to us, don't be so independent. If somebody comes to bring you something, then you go, oh, no, 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 no. Well, thank you anyway, but no, no. If somebody's trying to hand you something, hand you a blessing of some kind, say thank you. And then thank the Father for taking care of you because God takes care of us, guess what? Through other brothers and sisters. Now, I know many of us are very independent. We want to be the one caring for everybody. And I'm just as bad as anybody else. But there have been times in my life that I needed things, and sometimes I didn't realize I had a need yet, and people have given something to me, and, and I, I make myself say thank you, and I'm always overwhelmed, and I always find shortly after what the need was. Let, let God do what he wants to do to you. God wants to bless you through somebody. Let him bless you through somebody. He says, so that you have, provide Give alms. Provide for yourself bags which wax not old. Provide yourself a purse or a, a money bag that doesn't get old. A treasure in the heavens that faileth not. Where no thief approaches, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. This is a wonderful statement about putting our heart with God. But it also is a convicting statement because all we have to do is ask ourselves when we look at our budget, where does the bulk of our money go? To us or to God? One of the easiest ways to tell where we stand with Jesus is to look at where we put the most of our money. What's the focus of what we spend? What's the focus of what we do with the resources God gives us? Do we use those for God, to God, with God? Is that our primary focus or is it on stuff? And only, only we can answer that with, between ourselves and with God. I'm not asking you to answer that out loud. And then he says, be ready. And, and I, you know, when I used to read this, I used to think, this is just so awkward because he just says, so let your loins be girded about, verse 35, and your lights burning, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that ye, when he cometh and knocketh, that ye may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself and make them sit down to meet and will come forth and serve him, serve them. And, and if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know, that if the good man of the house had known the hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. But ye therefore, be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. I thought, it just seemed out of place at first until you start reading the context of what he's telling them. God will provide. Don't 
worry about stuff. Don't worry about food. Don't worry about clothing. Set your eyes, set your heart on the kingdom of God so that when the sun returns, you're ready. If our focus is on this world, the things of this world, Jesus will be like a thief in the night to us. We'll be so stunned that he showed up. We won't be ready. We won't be a faithful servant serving. We'll be like, as he goes on later to explain, the slothful servant who is, who is drinking and, and beating the fellow servants because he didn't think he was coming back. He had time. He wasn't worried about it. He wasn't tending to the things of the Father. We are the children of God if we've trusted Christ as our Savior, and we have some responsibilities here. Our responsibilities is not about amassing a fortune. It's not about stockpiling stuff. It's not about packing closets full of clothing. It's not about, about packing food. It's not about any of those things. It's about serving the Lord and letting him guide us in what he needs us to do and how he wants us to do. This is, again, this is not saying you can't have a reserve of food. You can't have a bank account. That's not what this is talking about. It's talking about the priority being on Jesus and not the food bank, not the bank account, but being on Christ. And if our priority is on Christ and we don't worry about all this other stuff knowing that God's going to take care of it, then that leaves us free. If we can't do anything about our height, if we can't even do the simple things that God says are, are just the least things, then why should we be concerned about everything else? If we've got to trust God for this thing that's going on with this body, and then, then why can't we trust him for something simple as clothing and food and a place to live? Why can't we just trust him for that? And if we do that, that relieves all of the pressure. I now don't have to go around focused on, okay, so i got to make sure I get food. i got to make sure I get, I get a bank account. i got to make sure I've got this. i got to make sure. No, God's going to take care of that. He will give me everything I need, and he'll even give me some desires of my heart when I'm in line with him. So if I'll just get my eyes set on the kingdom of God and start thinking about what can I do to build treasure where my father is? How can I build treasure there, because whether I'm in a tuxedo or rags, I'm clothed. I'm worried about what I got there. Because what I have there is what I will get one day to lay down at the feet of Jesus to show him that I loved him back. And if I'm focused on that, when the Lord comes, because I'm looking for him, and I'm serving, I'm anxious, and I'm and not anxious like a, like a scared, oh, anxiety ring my hands, but I'm anxious like, I know he's coming back anytime soon. I've got to be busy. I want to make sure that when he shows up, I want to make sure that when dad walks through the door, the yard is mowed. I want to make sure when the clouds split and Jesus steps out, that I have been found in service, that I'm looking for him. I don't know about you, I totally believe that the cloud the Bible speaks on is his glory that he will step out and call us up in the rapture. But just in case it's a real fluffy cloud, every time I see clouds, I'm looking and wondering, is that the one? I want to be ready. I don't want the Lord to come and find me doing something totally inappropriate. I don't want him to find me worrying about whether or not I got enough clothes. I don't want him to find me standing in front of my closet going, did I wear the green last week or the gray? Maybe I'll just go pull up the video and see what I wore. I did that one time. How lame is that? I went and pulled up the video just to see because I couldn't remember what I wore. Who cares? Who cares? When the Lord comes, I want him to find my priorities on him, thinking about him and looking for him, enjoying, longing for his presence. And if I'm doing that, I don't have to worry about everything else because I know my Father is going to make sure I have whatever I need. He's going to make sure I have food. <laughs> he had never failed to provide food for me. In fact, I need, I need his instruction on how to pull back from the table and take the knife to the throat. I don't have a food issue. I don't have a clothing issue. I don't have any of those. I don't have to. And the poorest people on the earth, if they will trust Christ, they don't have to worry about it either. Because the Father 
that puts the prettiest clothing on the grass that is here and gone and feeds the ravens that for, I mean, what purpose does a raven serve? It's just God's creation. And he feeds everyone. We're worth more than sparrows. We're more than ravens. We're so valuable that Jesus came and died on a cross for us. We don't have to worry about him taking care of us. I don't care what happens. I don't care how it looks. I don't care what the market does. I don't care what the country does. I don't care what the world does. My father created the world. This world doesn't affect him at all. It's not a problem. He takes care of all of it. Have we trusted Christ as our Savior? Have we said, Jesus, save me. I'm a sinner. And if we have, do we get up in the morning and say, God, help me stay focused on you today. What can I do to build the kingdom? What can I do to get some more stuff that I can lay down at your feet to show you I love you? What can I do today? Who can I talk to? God, would you send me someone? I love, I know I've mentioned it before, but I love Richard Warbrand's, te Warbrand's testimony when he talks about a man in a village that couldn't get out anymore like he wanted to. He never, he just wanted to lead a Jew to Jesus. And he said, I'm an old man. I can't go. But if you'll bring a Jew to me, I will do my best to bring him to you. And that's where Richard Warbrand just wandered into just happened to find that guy. And what a testimony of God's grace. I just want to know, what can I do today, Father? Will you put somebody in my path that I can share your grace with? And Lord, remind me that you're coming. Remind me to look up because I know redemption is drawn. Now remind me to keep in my mind, you're, you're about here. I don't want to be found humming around, doing nothing for Jesus. How about you? Father, whatever our need is, would you speak to that, Father? Would you touch our hearts and show us what we need? Show us if there's something that is lacking or something that we need to add. Show us something that is there that needs to be removed. If we have a sin, a pet sin that we just refuse to give up, would you, would you reveal that to us and help us today to say, Father, just take this. I'm going to walk away from it. I'm going to find something else to do. Every time I'm tired, every time I'm frustrated, every time I'm bored, I, I go to this sin. But from now on, I'm going to go to your word. I'm going to go in prayer. I'm going to do something different. I'm, I need your help. I need you to help me put something of you in place of where this sin was. So, Father, would you show if we have something like that and help us find a way to replace it. Just trying to get rid of something. It's like taking a, a flat tire off a car and then trying to drive without putting a good something in its place, a good tire in its place. So, so help us, Father. If we haven't trusted Christ as our Savior, if there's someone who are here or listening who has not yet said, Jesus, I'm a sinner, I need you to save me and ask for forgiveness, Father, please let this be the day they realize you take care of your own, and the only way we become yours is when we trust your Son who you sent to die for us. We love you, Father. We ask for your touch and your presence right now. In Jesus' name we pray.